now just past 1 p.m. So I think we'll get started. Good afternoon, folks, from wherever you may be joining us. I hope you're doing well this afternoon. Thank you for tuning into the Invasive Species Center webinar series. My name is Liam Breakin. I am the Business Development and Communications Intern here at the ISC, and I'm going to be your moderator for today. I'm glad to be joining you from Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario. I'd like to also acknowledge that this is the Robinson Huron Treaty Territory, the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, home of the Garden River First Nation, Batchewana First Nation, and Metis Nation. As a very brief introduction to the ISC, the Invasive Species Centre is a not-for-profit organization that works to protect Canada's land and water from invasive species by connecting stakeholders to catalyze invasive species management and communicate policy and science knowledge. I will go over a couple introductory items. I do want to mention that there will be a brief survey at the end of the webinar, so if you could take a few minutes to fill that out, it does help us improve for future webinars. If you have technical difficulties at some point, um, during uh, the talk today, then send me an email at uh, the email displayed below and I can see if I can help you with your connectivity issues. I'm also glad to be joined by our speakers today to talk about, as the title indicates, new biological control methods for invasive plants in Canada. Ian Jones and Michael McTavish are postdoctoral researchers at the, for at the Smith Forest Health Lab at the University of Toronto and Agriculture and Agri-Foods Canada. Ian's research focuses on insect-plant interactions, predom predominantly in the context of weed biocontrol, biological control systems. Much of Ian's current work is focused on the biological control of Japanese knotweed and invasive swallowworts. Michael's current research includes insect-based biological control of introduced common reed, or Phragmites australis, and garlic mustard, and understanding the novel ecological impacts of exotic invasive earthworms in forests. I will forewarn you that Ian and Michael will each have about a 25-minute presentation today, amounting to a total of 50 minutes, and that will likely take us close to the full hour once we get underway. Since this is the case, then in the, event, in the event of a larger volume of questions throughout the presentation, Ian and Michael's colleague, Rob Bourchier, will also be on the line as he has helped to keep an eye on the chat box and field any questions that you may have as they come in. We will still have a brief question period at the end of the presentation, and Rob will leave some, unanswered, leave some questions to be unanswered for that time, and he will adapt on how quickly they do come in. So at any time, feel free to submit a question to the chat box in the control panel. Um, with that said, I'm going to give control to Ian. We'll start us off today with the first half of the presentation. So Ian, over to you. Okay, thank you, Liam. I'm unmuted, so I hope everyone can hear me. Um, I'm gonna start um, today by giving you a quick overview of um, the talk I was gonna give it. And finding, oh, here we go. Uh, then I'll give you a little bit of background about um, what biological control is um, and how we see it in the in the broader scheme of controlling invasive weeds in Canada. Then we'll go through the three systems. Um, so yeah, the four systems that we're going to be updating you on are, for my part, Japanese knotweed um, and black and pale swallowwort. Um, that's the point where I'll hand over to Michael McTavish who will tell you about Phragmites or common reed and garlic mustard. And then Michael, I think, is going to wrap up by talking a bit more about biological control, um, largely in the context of integrated weed management. So yeah, you can advance this. So the first system that I'm going to update you on is Japanese knotweed. And I'm going to use that as an example to talk a little bit about why it is we care about invasive plants. Um, so if you look at the knotweed stand on the picture on the left hand side there, that's the kind of dense monoclonal stand of Japanese knotweed that we find in a lot of environments. And that clearly is just shading out much of the existing native vegetation. And that knotweed will drop its leaves in the fall and that intense uh, leaf drop will uh, make it very difficult for any even small herbaceous plants to take hold in that environment. So there's a big um, kind of impact on biodiversity. In addition to that, uh, knotweed grows in a lot of different habitat types, but one of the places we see it most commonly is um, growing along riverbanks. And because knotweed has a very robust root system, 
but not a very fibrous one. It allows for a lot of soil erosion, uh, and that has a big impact on, um, on water quality, uh, with a knock-on impact on a lot of the fauna that we'd expect to be seeing in those, uh, those environments. So as well as those ecological factors, there are economic ones. Uh, the picture on the right shows knotweed growing through tarmac. Um, it can grow through almost any medium and even uh, on occasion has been found growing into people's homes. So there's a clear impact there on infrastructure and on property prices. And these are some of the economic impacts associated with the weed. So Liam, you might have to flick a few times to get it to the next one because there's a couple of things that are going to appear as you do so, but we'll go to the next slide. That's it. So this is um, a quote from one of the lead developers from the Olympic site for the 2012 Olympics in London. And, and he said, the site's been a challenge. We've identified unexploded wartime bombs and Japanese knotweed, the bombs we can deal with. And he wasn't really joking in as much as it's estimated that a four hectare patch of knotweed on this site cost them about 65 million pounds to deal with. So this is because the plant grows back vegetatively from even small root sections left in the soil. So it's important to uh, not only remove the root system with mechanical machinery, but also conduct soil filtration treatments and chemical treatments to make sure the weed's not going to come back and, and damage the infrastructure they're creating. And that, I think, in, in conjunction with delays to the development uh, led to these massive economic costs. Yeah, so next slide, Liam. So in terms of our treatment options for knotweed, these are are things that most of you will be very, very familiar with and they go across the board for uh, really most of these invasive plants. So herbicide sprays uh, are effective against knotweed, uh, but again from the picture on the right hand side, that's a pretty daunting task to try to control an infestation like this with a, a herbicide sprayer. And so it's not something that's really feasible at the scale of the problem, and it's also unsafe in a lot of situations. So we saw knotweed growing along a water body we clearly can't spray chemical sprays in those situations. Um, if you can advance just one time, Liam. So some of those, uh, those safety concerns about herbicide treatments can be mediated through these more kind of direct systemic delivery approaches like stem injections. And these are really uh, useful for killing individual plants. But again, it's not something that really um, can be useful at the scale of the infestation. Yeah, next slide. I'm going to go ahead and give you one more chance at, at uh, controlling the keyboard. So just okay. try now. So do I need to click the mouse on the screen first, or? Yeah, give it a go. Give it a go. Oh, was that? Maybe not. Okay, uh, so the other uh, control option that we have, traditionally speaking, is manual removal. So we can remove the above ground plant parts for Japanese knotweed fairly easily, assuming that we can access the infestation, uh, which is not always the case. But because of the robust rhizome system underground, uh, this plant stores quite a lot of its, um, its energy and its root, root system underground, it tends to just be the first thing to bounce right back up. So this picture on the right, shows a patch of knotweed that was cleared five weeks earlier. And you just see the knotweed coming back with very little opportunity for native plants to regain a foothold. And this kind of large rhizome underground is a, a feature that we'll see um, across a lot of these invasive plants. The more effective way uh, to remove Japanese knotweed is to remove the whole plant, including the root system. So that's the one click link. But this root system, as you can see, is incredibly thick and woody um, and it involves heavy machinery. So it's not really um, something that's feasible, again, at the scale of the problem. So we can see there's a, a critical need for additional control options to supplement existing management tools. And I want to highlight that idea of additional control options and supplementation to make the point that we don't really think of uh, biological control as a silver bullet that's going to uh, control or least of all eliminate uh, invasive plants on its own. It's very much another tool in the toolkit um, 
that will allow us to kind of add to our existing treatment options, but importantly, to be effective in situations where traditional control options uh, sometimes can't be. So next slide, Liam. It might make sense to just click through all of the bullet points um, and then go from there. Yeah, perfect, thank you. So just to, um, to define biological control is the use of organisms. So in this case, we're talking about insects to suppress introduced pests. So in our case, we're talking about uh, invasive weeds. And so to give you a bit of the rationale behind it, a lot of these invasive plants become invasive in part because they've been separated from their native herbivores. And so what we're doing is reuniting them with those herbivores to apply a little bit of pressure um, to hopefully allow native plants to become competitive enough to regain a foothold in some of these environments. What's nice about it is that it's self-sustaining. Um, the insects, once they're established, uh, will reproduce themselves and even track the host. Um, and for that reason, it's cost effective because it doesn't have to be uh, reapplied every summer in the way that most traditional controls would. And finally, and possibly most importantly, it's host specific. So it has a very low environmental impact. And I'll talk more in a little while about the efforts that we go to to make sure that these insects are completely specific to the weed that we're targeting. But what's important here is that in contrast to a lot of uh, traditional control measures like herbicide use and manual removal, these are techniques that are, are very difficult to just target the invasive plant. Um, and so often they're only used in, situation, in situations where the plant has kind of become almost a monoculture and taken the habitat over. Whereas biological control can be effective in situations where the invasive weed is there, uh, but hasn't yet kind of taken over an environment. So it's a very useful tool for holding back the spread of infestations. What this slide shows is uh, the seven fundamental steps of a biological control program uh, in a format that some of you might be familiar with. So from horizon scanning, this is kind of understanding uh, and having the foresight to know when uh, a non-native plant may be becoming an invasive problem, all the way through foreign exploration for biological control agents and the risk assessments, so host range testing predominantly. And that risk assessment phase is usually the longest phase of any biological control program. And then finally through uh, releases and monitoring. And so as I take you through uh, the timeline of the programs that we're updating you on, you'll see these numbers referenced to give you an indication of the progress that we're, we're making on these, uh, these programs. So yeah, next slide. Liam, this might be another one where it's worth just clicking through, yeah, perfect. So this is the insect that we're working with um, for Japanese knotweed, Athalara itadori, which is a small sap-sucking insect. It's a psyllid, about four millimeters long as an adult. And we first collected these insects in 2004 from Kyushu in southern Japan. And then a second line was collected in 2007 um, from the northern island of Hokkaido. Um, and one of the reasons for this is that Japanese knotweed is actually part of a, an invasive species complex. So we have Japanese knotweed, giant knotweed, and then the hybrid, which is bohemian knotweed. And those two psyllid lines, the uh, Kyushu and Hokkaido, have slightly different preferences in terms of their performance on those different species. So in 2008, we began extensive host range testing, and then we submitted the petition to release Athalara itadori in North America in 2012. So that period is kind of four to five years in this case. What that petition involves is essentially a summary of all of that risk assessment data, that host range testing. Um, to show that we're completely satisfied that these insects are uh, specific to Japanese knotweed. So when the insects are first collected, they're brought into highly secure labs in North America, and they're tested on a huge range of plants, starting with plants that are closely related to Japanese knotweed, then plants that are of cultural or economic significance in North America, plants that commonly co-occur with Japanese knotweed in the, um, in the invasion sites, um, and we're checking to see if the insect can feed on those plants um, and then also if the insect can complete their life cycle on the plants. And only when we're completely satisfied that the insects are, are completely specific to Japanese knotweed do we submit this petition. So that petition was um, accepted and initial releases uh, carried out in Canada in 2014 um, and much later in 2020 uh, in the US. 
So we're now in the phase of this program where we're uh, ramping up our numbers of insects that we release. Um, so we put out 34,000 psyllids plus across sites in North America in this past summer. Next slide. That's good. Yeah, if you go back one, that would be good. That's it. So um, the phase in the program that we're in right now, and this is um, the largest part of my involvement, is research into the biology of the insect to try and improve our ability to get it established uh, in the, the invaded range. Um, and so what I want to do is take you quickly through the life cycle of the insect and some of the release strategies that we've used to highlight some of the obstacles that we've come up against in that process. Um, and that's to explain uh, really why we're focusing on certain elements of the insect's biology in order to improve the, uh, the insect's performance in the field. So these insects will lay 600 to 700 eggs uh, in the spring. They go through five nymphal stages and then emerge as adults. And we'll see several generations in a given summer within, uh, within release sites. But then late in the fall, these insects will go into a diapause state and then they'll overwinter as adults. So they tend to be tucked into crevices in the bark of pine trees or in leaf litter. And that's how they go through the winter. So you can click on a couple more. Okay, go one more. And one more again. Thanks, Liam. So this is the kind of, uh, we've released them in several ways, but this is probably the most uh, common way that we've released the insect. And that is to rear them in the lab in diapause conditions. So we'll, we'll rear them at slightly lower day lengths to put them into diapause. And then we'll put them out into the field in the fall and see them overwinter. And we've found that they successfully overwinter. If you can do one click, Liam. Uh, and this is a huge uh, hurdle for any biological control program, uh, particularly in temperate climates and one uh, like here where we have relatively severe winters. So that's great news for the agent. So uh, a couple more clicks. Thanks, Liam. So then what we find is the following spring, we get lots of eggs uh, in those release sites. So we know they're overwintering successfully. We then initially see lots of nymphs. Um, but what happens is we tend to see those nymphs then kind of um, drop off and slowly disappear. And so we haven't actually seen this insect established over several generations uh, in any release sites in Canada so far. And it seems that the, the hurdle that we're coming up against is this high level of nymphal mortality in the field. So a lot of our research has been focused on that, trying to understand what's causing that mortality so that we can mitigate it in some way. Okay, go ahead, Liam. So it's probably worth clicking a couple more times. That's enough, perfect. So another part of this, uh, this story is that the nymphs are performing incredibly well in the greenhouse and in the lab. They've been really easy insects to rear, which is a big part of any biological control program. But they perform so well in the lab, and then we see this nymphal mortality in the field. One of the potential problems that might be driving that is that they're, they're exposed to predators in the field. And so we've conducted these um, predator and predator exclusion experiments in Uxbridge, Ontario. So these potted plants on the right hand side were all seeded with hundreds of Aphalara itadori nymphs, then placed out into the field, but some of them were control plants. So predators have full access to the plants, while others um, have crawling predators excluded by painting a sticky resin called Tanglefoot around the pot. And others have predators entirely excluded, including flying predators, by painting Tanglefoot, but also uh, putting this mesh bag over the plants. So those plants are then ex exposed to predators for several weeks um, in this field site in Uxbridge. And then we bring the plants back in um, and look at how many of those nymphs have survived. What we found was uh, that we get significant mortality through predation in those control plants and not very much difference in the mortality between those two exclusion treatments, which tells us firstly that uh, these nymphs are susceptible to predation in North American field sites. Um, but it also tells us that most of that predation seems to be coming from small crawling insects um, or even mites in some cases. So what we weren't able to do in this experiment is actually identify the specific predators involved. So that's the next stage in this project. Because if we can do that, we can then try to mitigate their effects by adjusting our release strategy, maybe releasing 
uh, at different times of the season or in different habitat types to try and choose periods where those particular predators might be less active. So you can go a couple of clicks, I think, Liam. So one more. So the other big difference that we might find between these um, greenhouse plants and the plants in the field is foliage quality. So the insects that we're working with um, have been reared um, through all of this host range testing in the greenhouse and in the lab since 2004. Um, so rearing them through all of those generations in uh, greenhouse conditions, we may have selected for individuals that are less able to survive on the harsher conditions that are found out in, in the field. And that's what our experiments have shown. In fact, we see much greater mortality of nymphs on older plant material and on plants that have been exposed to high light conditions, all things that increase leaf toughness. So if you advance one slide, Liam. So where we are in the project really now is that uh, in 2019, CABI UK went back out to Kyushu to collect another line of these civids. And we're hopeful that this new line of civids is much better field adapted, um, less kind of coddled in the, in the laboratory, um, and so should be much better able to survive this kind of harsher foliage in the field. And our early data is suggesting exactly that, that they're performing much, much better on older plant material and more stressed plant material. So we're hopeful that that new line of psyllids can go a long way to solving some of the problems we've had getting this insect established. Okay, next slide. So I'm going to switch now to the second uh, system that I want to update you all on. This is invasive swallow warts. Uh, so you may know, many of you may know it as dog strangling vine. This is pale swallow warts on the right hand side. Um, it's invasive across the northeastern US as well as Ontario and Quebec um, and if you're not familiar with it as you can see from the picture it, it generates these kind of twining mats um, that smother and kind of outcompete a lot of the native vegetation. But particular concerns we have about this species are that it's a threat to albar communities which are rare communities in central Canada and it's also a, a sink for monarch butterflies. So it's closely related to milkweed. So the monarchs will readily lay their eggs on it, but the caterpillars can't actually complete development on it. And so um, it's a big source of mortality for monarch butterflies. Next slide. So the insect that we're working with uh, for invasive swallow warts is Hypena opulenta, which is a moth in the family Arebidae. Um, this is a timeline, Liam, so maybe click through all of them again. Perfect, thank you. So Hypena opulenta was one of five agents that um, was collected in initial trips to Ukraine, uh, the native range, but it emerged as uh, the most promising agent um, due to the amount of damage that it's able to inflict on the plant. Um, and so we began host range testing in 2007. Like the knotweed psyllid, that took about four to five years before we released the petition or submitted the petition. And that was approved in 2013. And we began releasing the insect in Canada in 2014. So I'm delighted to say that by 2016, we had confirmed establishment of Hypena opulenta in Canadian field sites. So we have populations of this insect uh, that are sustaining themselves over multiple years in release sites and even tracking the weed, uh, the population spreading upwards of two kilometers from initial release sites. So we're in a good position there. That's where we want to be in terms of having the insect established. In the US, uh, releases again were delayed, and so we're kind of in an earlier phase uh, with releases and monitoring in that part of the world. So next slide, Lee. So similar to the psyllid, I want to take you through quickly the life cycle of the insect. Uh, and some of the obstacles that we've come up against um, to try and uh, explain how we're directing our research to attempt to get this uh, insect better established and increase the size of populations in the field. So these moths emerge in the spring, they lay around 400 eggs, they go through five larval instars before pupating uh, on the plant or more commonly in the soil. And when it comes to the fall, they're all, all the pupae are then in the soil, buried maybe two or three centimeters down, and that's where they, they go through the winter. So we know they're, they're slightly freeze tolerant, they can, uh, they can survive being frozen to a certain extent, 
And we know obviously that they're, they're getting through the winter successfully here because we have populations established over several years. Yeah, if you can move on one slide, Liam. Perfect, that's great. So um, by far the, the most effective release technique that we have for these insects is to release adults in the spring. Um, and as I say, we know that we're getting successful over wintering because we have these insects established. So a lot of our research has been geared around um, trying to increase field populations and gain a better level of control of the weed. So next slide. Uh, if you can do one more click. Great, thanks Liam. So the biggest hurdle that we've come up against uh, with this insect is that uh, typically in the native range in Ukraine, the insect will go through two generations in a summer. Um, whereas what we found is in many of our release sites in Canada, we see only one generation and then those insects go into diapause early. So that's problematic for a couple of reasons. If we don't get two generations, we don't build up population sizes as quickly as we otherwise would. Um, so we're not gonna have as big an impact on the weed. But secondly, if those insects go into diapause early, say in midsummer, then the plant has the rest of the season to recover from that early season herbivory. So it, it undoes a lot of the good that the agent did early in the season. So for a long time, we've been trying to um, establish why this early diapause happens. And we've known for a long time that it's um, day length is the factor that puts these insects uh, into diapause. And so the problem we're having is largely related to the fact that the longest days in the summer in Ukraine are just that much longer uh, than our long summer days in Canada. So a lot of the research we've now been doing most recently is to try and understand what the specific critical day length is that sends these insects into diapause. And I'll explain a bit later why that's useful to us. So if you can click uh, a couple of clicks. That's it, perfect. Uh, one more, you can go to the next one. Thanks, Liam. So what we've done is reared these insects in a range of different day lengths in growth chambers to try and establish what that critical or threshold day length is that stimulates diapause in the insects. And what we found is a pretty clear cutoff around 15 hours, between 15 and 15 and a half hours. Um, and that's the day length where anything shorter than that will put the insects into diapause. So next slide. So the way that that's useful um, is that we can superimpose that knowledge onto the existing release sites that we have. So you can see the release sites on the left-hand side going from north to south. So the northern sites in Ottawa down to the most southern sites in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Uh, then you have the latitude, and then in the third column, the longest days in any of those sites. So then in the final two columns, what we have is a date range, and then a number of days for which the days are long enough to stimulate a second generation in these insects. So that window might be almost two months in Ottawa in the north, but actually zero days down in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. So this is useful to us, first of all, because early on in the program, our release uh, strategy involved just getting as many insects out as we could all summer um, to try and establish them. What we now know is that there's a relatively narrow window early in the summer that we need to get our releases done in order to get two generations in these sites. We can also potentially um, prioritize sites where we have a much better chance of getting two generations. But that's not to write off sites like Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. We know we're only going to get one generation in that site, um, but it doesn't necessarily mean it can't work there. It just will take longer for the population to, to build up to a level where it's effectively controlling the weed. OK, next slide. Yeah, so that's where we are really in this program. We're in an adaptation phase and a growth phase for the insect. We, ha we have the insect established in release sites, so we're where we want to be in that sense, but it will take a while for populations to rise um, to a level where we're seeing effective control of the weed. And in some ways you can look at this in the context of invasion biology. Most of these invasive plants that we're talking about have been in North America for many, many years, 
then the process of becoming an invasive problem uh, takes many, many years to happen. We're hoping it will be a lot quicker in this case, but it does take some time for these populations to build up to such a level where we're seeing effective control. And so that's where we are with this program right now. So this is where I pass over to Michael. So I'll let you, I'll mute myself and, and let you carry on, Michael. Hey, great. Thanks very much, Ian. Should be online here now, so hopefully everyone is hearing this. Uh, we'll see if I have any better luck with the uh, the slide control here. And yes, good sign. Excellent. Um, so good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for being here. Uh, I'm going to jump in on our two remaining systems that we're working on in this group. Uh, so introduce Phragmites and garlic mustard. Uh, it's worth noting at the top here that both of these projects are at a slightly earlier stage of development um, compared to the two systems that we've we've heard from so far. Um, so we're going to start with introduce common reed, uh, by which we're referring to Phragmites australis subspecies australis. Um, this is considered one of the most invasive wetland plants in North America and is no doubt very familiar, familiar to many of us here. Uh, it's thought to have been introduced from Eurasia in the late 19th century, continues to spread across North America, and is a, an unfortunately familiar site in many built environments, such as swim ponds and uh, ditches along, way, along highways, but is also found in more natural areas as well. The big challenge with introduced Phragmites is it tends to form these very dense, nearly monospecific stands, and these can have various ecological and socioeconomic harms. Chief among this uh, tends to be uh, reductions in biodiversity, uh, including uh, losses of our native subspecies of Phragmites, Phragmites, which is of conservation value. It can also alter various ecological processes, such as uh, hydrology. It can reduce aesthetic and property values, and impair sight lines and increase fire risk. On account of these various impacts, there's of course a great deal of interest in tools to manage Phragmites, uh, and there are many different uh, techniques already used, including herbicides, burning, mowing, rolling, and, and others. Um, and while these can be successful in certain, uh, certain contexts, in others, existing control can be limited in effectiveness, it can be expensive, uh, and as we've heard from in our other systems, uh, environmentally harmful. So there are often concerns, for example, about off-target impacts to other species. Um, and so biocontrol enters here as a, a very appealing supplement. Biocontrol of introduced Phragmites in North America is based on two European moths with stem boring larvae. So shown here, we have Archenera nerica and Lenisa gemini puncta. Both of these are natural pests of Phragmites in its native home range in Europe, uh, and the larvae bore through the shoots, consuming that tissue, causing stem wilt and stem mortality. So that's the actual damage to the plant that we're looking to achieve here. To give a general overview uh, of the life cycle of both of these insects, which are relatively similar, um, the larvae usually hatch in the spring and feed in the shoots for a period of about four to six weeks. So again, this uh, shoot mining behavior is where the actual damage to the plant is, is happening. After that time, they will remain in the stems and they will pupate there for a period of about 26 to 40 days, after which they will emerge from the stems as adults for a fairly short period of time and mate. And then females will typically lay around 100 to 150 eggs uh, that are laid uh, beneath the close-fitting leaf sheaths of the plant against the stem. So they'll be there through the summer, the fall, and will overwinter through until the following spring. Biocontrol of Phragmites has been in development uh, for uh, a long period of time. So as seems to be a recurring theme, you'll, you'll notice uh, these programs do take time to implement. Um, so this began with initial proposals and insect explorations back in 1998. Uh, by 2005, uh, the agents were, were more or less selected at that point. And then again, we see this long period of, of great care taken to conduct host range testing of the agents to ensure host specificity. So this began in 2007. This culminated in a joint Canadian and US release petition uh, that was put out in 2018. And this was approved for release in Canada in 2019 by the Canadian Food Inspection Agency. And that brings us up to the present day uh, where we are at with our Ontario pilot program. 
So if we look at this from a research standpoint, our primary goal here is to implement the first biocontrol program uh, for introduced Phragmites in Southern Ontario at a pilot scale using our two agents here. We can break this down into more specific objectives, which include background monitoring of Phragmites. So this would include both the introduced subspecies and the native subspecies. Um, as this is the first control program using these insects, really our main focus here, especially in these early days, is on basically developing these core methodologies for rearing, release, and monitoring. So essentially, how do we actually produce large numbers of the insect and store them? How do we put them out into the environment? And how do we monitor to see the degree to which they've become established and the impacts that they are hopefully having? Related to this, uh, our objectives include to establish preliminary nurse sites in Ontario. So these would be locations where insects are established and self-sustaining, so we can go back to them, monitor them, and collect insects in future. So if we take a timeline approach and we zoom in on some of the current and upcoming projects uh, related to Phragmites biocontrol, my own work in this project began in summer 2019. Uh, with a survey of 63 native and introduced Phragmites sites across southern Ontario. Um, so this was an opportunity to study the distribution and interactions of these different subspecies, uh, to learn more about their morphology, and importantly, to identify candidate sites for future biocontrol releases and experimentation. This past spring, so 2020, uh, marked the first release that I was involved with uh, that used um, uh, insect eggs at two different sites. Um, so as Ian has mentioned, uh, a major focus in these programs is deciding at which life stage you actually introduce the agents, and they can have different pros and cons associated with each. So in this case, we were attempting releases as eggs, and we had different egg groups um, where we were looking at uh, differences in overwintering storage conditions, uh, and temperatures, and locations, uh, insects that had been reared with different diets, so different mixtures of uh, insects fed on artificial diet or those that had been supplemented with field collected vegetation. And we were also comparing different release methods. Uh, so something that became very apparent quite early on with the eggs was that these are potentially quite uh, vulnerable to weather conditions and to predation. Uh, so we wanted to look at different release methods that might mitigate those impacts. Uh, so you see here pictured two of the different uh, techniques that we tried. Uh, in the middle, this included gluing the eggs, uh, which are quite small, onto these small pieces of cards that are then secured around the stem. So this is sort of emulating the natural leaf sheath laying behavior that we see in the insects. Uh, we also tried gluing eggs to the, the inside of these inverted screening cups to offer protection that way. So we've been comparing how those different techniques perform. Our more recent work has been um, going towards preparing for additional releases at uh, this coming spring, so in 2021. Uh, we're planning to attempt releases uh, instead as larvae at two additional sites, um, and we will be comparing overwintering storage again. So looking at eggs that have been stored in controlled indoor conditions, eggs that have been exposed to more natural fluctuations outdoors, and eggs that have been stored uh, back in the home range that will be shipped to us uh, at the very last minute. So again, especially with this early stage project, a lot of this work right now is, is uh, working towards scaling up basic rearing techniques and releases and actually aiming to get it out on, on more sites. And that takes us to our final system that we're gonna be looking at today, and that is garlic mustard or Aliaria pediolata. This is a non-native invasive herb that is unfortunately quite common in forested habitats, probably quite familiar to many of us here. Uh, it's a culinary and medicinal herb that was brought over from Europe in the 1800s. It's a biennial understory plant, so it exists as both these first-year basil rosettes and also second-year bolted plants, which are the ones that actually produce the seed. It's very common in disturbed forests, so for example, along footpaths, but can also be found in undisturbed sites. The main concerns with garlic mustard are primarily tied to reductions in biodiversity. This is a very aggressive, uh, highly competitive species. It grows very rapidly, very early in the spring, produces large numbers of seeds that contribute to a long-lasting and persistent seed bank. And it's also allelopathic, so it can alter soil chemistry in a way that is disadvantageous to other plants and mycorrhizal associations. 
So again, with all these impacts, there's great interest in garlic mustard management. Uh, it tends to be a very common target of physical removal. So uh, very common to see community pullings where you get uh, community members out to help try and remove this. Um, you can also have other forms of physical and chemical removal, such as fire or herbicides, though these are somewhat rarer. Um, as is the case with most of these systems, there are situations in which these existing controls can work really well. Um, in the case of garlic mustard, it's particularly useful for outreach and raising awareness of invasive species issues, uh, but they often tend to be very labor intensive, uh, small scale and short term in impact. So again, biocontrol has a lot of promise to supplement what we're already doing here. So biocontrol of garlic mustard in North America is uh, what we're developing using a European root crown mining weevil, uh, Pseudorhynchus scrobicolis, shown here from left to right as an adult weevil, uh, in the middle as uh, the larvae burrowing through the, the root crown of the plant. And on the right, if you really kind of squint and get in close, there are very small little yellow dots, which are the eggs uh, embedded in the tissue of the leaf. Uh, you can also see those sort of translucent uh, window pane patches which is uh, what the adult feeding looks like. So in this system, most of the damage to the plant uh, comes from the larval root crown mining. Um, so the larvae burrowing through and feeding on tissues in the root crown does most of the damage, uh, though this minor adult leaf window pane feeding uh, also does some damage as well. This tends to reduce garlic mustard survival, uh, growth and reproductive output. The general life cycle of Pseudorhynchus scrobicolis is slightly more complicated. Uh, part of this comes from the fact that uh, adults can live uh, in excess of a year uh, under certain conditions, so they can be uh, present year round. They tend to emerge uh, from the soil in May and June and will then typically estivate for the summer. So they are dormant for most of the hot and dry periods of the summer. When they are active, uh, they are feeding on garlic mustard leaves and will also lay eggs in the leaves and the stems uh, from fall through to spring. So during this continual uh, period of egg laying, you can have eggs hatching and larvae will then move into the root crown, mine that tissue again through this period of fall all the way through to spring. Uh, so you can actually have all three of these different life stages present um, at the same time throughout uh, good chunks of the year. Finally, uh, after this period of time in the late spring, larvae will exit the plants and pupate in the soil to then emerge as adults. The program timeline for garlic mustard biocontrol is in some ways fairly similar to the Phragmites story. Uh, insect, uh, the initial proposals and explorations for candidate uh, agents began in 1998 and switched over pretty quickly in 1999 to uh, host range testing using the, the leading candidates. Again, this is a process that takes place over many years and involves quite a bit of work and culminated in an American uh, release permit that was submitted in 2016. In 2017, a US release was recommended on the basis of that permit, though the permitting process is still continuing and is ongoing to the present day. Related to this US permit was a Canadian permit, also submitted in 2017. In 2018, that Canadian permit was approved by the CFIA. Uh, so releases are permitted in Canada now. In 2018, uh, this saw uh, garlic mustard background monitoring of populations. We have a, a suite of 24 sites across uh, Ontario that are being monitored to the present day to generate background data for this project. Uh, and actually just before I got involved with it as well, 2019 saw uh, a couple of pilot field re releases at a couple of sites in Ontario. And that brings us now to our current position in the project. Again, our primary research goal is implementation of what is really the first biocontrol program for garlic mustard uh, using Pseudorhynchus scrobicolis. Um, and again, as such, it has many similarities with our Phragmites situation. Our objectives include background monitoring of garlic mustard. Uh, this is particularly important for the Swede uh, as this biennial life form and its life history tends to create quite a bit of variability in populations year to year, just naturally. So it's important to understand how it is changing even when the, the agent isn't present. So that's something that we're, uh, we always have going on. The main focus here is again, however, on developing core methods for rearing, releasing, and uh, monitoring the insects. And finally, we're trying to establish more of these nurse sites in Ontario. <laughs> 
If we take a look at current and upcoming projects, I mentioned we had those uh, releases at these two sites in uh, the spring and fall of 2019. These were done using different life stages, um, so both putting out adults and putting out uh, actual garlic mustard plants that were raised in the lab and were exposed to weevils such that they then have uh, those eggs and larvae that I showed earlier uh, associated with that plant material. So you can then put that out onto the site. So we'll be comparing the performance of these different methods. As I noted, we have this ongoing monitoring of 24 sites across uh, Southern Ontario. That is ongoing. Uh, but we also have this last summer, we were working on more targeted monitoring of those preliminary release sites as well um, to check for evidence of establishment of those agents. So some of the things that we're looking for in that case uh, include uh, shown here on the left, looking for some of that uh, characteristic window pane feeding on the leaves from the adults. Uh, and then on the right, another thing that we can do is go in and collect uh, shoots and roots and dissect those to look for visual evidence of larval tunneling. This past fall, we were kept fairly busy with um, a shipment of about 300 weevils that we had, uh, and were able to do our first in-house uh, batch of rearing and overwintering of infested plants. So we were um, putting a lot of effort into figuring out how to actually do that uh, with the resources that we have. And we were fortunately successful in uh, everything went quite well, and we were able to rear a collection of about 140 uh, rosettes that now have uh, weevil eggs and larvae in them. Uh, actually, just last week, we mulched these in, tucked them in for the winter. So we'll be going back the following spring to dig those up. And we'll be aiming to use them at maybe one or two additional sites for what will be the largest plant release in this project so far. Again, the focus here is on scaling up of both rearing and release. So that's our quick overview of these four different Ontario biocontrol programs that our group is working on uh, to give a very quick summary of the, the status of those then. Uh, as we noted, they are on slightly different timelines, uh, but if we compare them against these uh, biological control program stages that Ian introduced earlier, um, they're actually all sitting at about step five here. Um, so they're at this rearing field release site where we are in the process of um, well, rearing and releasing them into the field and developing methods for doing so. So in all of our cases here, uh, efforts have gone into understanding how these species interact in Canada. Agents have been uh, explored uh, overseas and identified. Their biology has been studied and in particular, as we've seen, a lot of time goes into this host range specificity testing. That's often a big chunk of that timeline uh, to make sure that that is as safe as it can be. Petitions for releases uh, have been submitted and approved, and we're now at this stage five. Um, you can see here the dates, uh, the years of the initial field releases in Canada. So we see that for knotweed and DSV, these are back in 2014. Phragmites and garlic mustard, more recent in 2019. Uh, but all in the coming years, we'll be looking at going ahead further with a shifted and increased focus on post release monitoring and evaluation. Um, so looking at uh, tools for tracking establishment in the field and the impacts that they're actually having uh, in particular on the the target weed. Beyond that, the focus becomes redistribution and even longer term, larger scale assessment. So I wanted to just wrap up with a, a few concluding thoughts and general reminders about biocontrol. Um, so this is going to speak to our four cases that we've talked about today, but also biocontrol more broadly. And the first thing we want to remember here is that biocontrol is really about long-term solutions for large-scale problems, and, and that's really what we have with all four of these systems. When we think of the scale of invasion, uh, the extent of spread that can happen with all of these, um, these are unique problems that really require as many uh, options for dealing with them as, as we can. At the same time, it's important to recognize that these are slower, longer-term solutions. So when we think of the arguable uh, very successful biocontrol story of purple loose strife. This is something that has really been in place since the 1980s and is ongoing to the present. Um, so they are slower to implement, but they do have many advantages. Uh, as noted earlier, ideally these are systems that are self-sustaining, sustainable, and useful for tracking widespread invasions both spatially and temporally. Second, the objective here is generally not complete eradication. Uh, what we're trying to aim for realistically here is instead an added pressure against the weed. The idea is to slow and limit spread 
decrease their competitiveness um, and give, uh, for example, other native biodiversity that is present a chance and that may then be potentially combined with other management tools as well. Third, uh, there are often concerns about the risks associated with biocontrol, uh, but it's important that those risks be compared against the risks of both other management and of doing nothing. Um, so when we think about the extensive host range testing that we've described that takes place over usually many years, uh, this is a major step in really mitigating that risk. It's also important to recognize, however, that other management tools such as burning an area or spraying broad, broad spectrum herbicides um, have risks and impacts of their own. And notably, with very aggressive uh, invasive species such as these, uh, doing nothing often carries great risk as well, which we, we see all too often. So these are the comparisons that actually need to be made. And finally, biocontrol is not a panacea, but it is very useful. It is ideally something that is thought of as an additional option in an expanded integrated pest management or IPM toolbox. What we're talking about here is not necessarily replacing other tools, but rather supplementing them. And so now that you have this broader suite of options, ideally you can choose where different management approaches may be more or less suitable in different contexts and may even be combined for increased effect. And so these are of course uh, large projects here uh, and they really can't happen without support from many uh, collaborators, both individuals and institutions. So on behalf of all of us, that's a big thank you to everyone who's involved here. Uh, if you have specific questions after the session, uh, we have contacts for both Ian and myself, please feel free to reach out. And I believe we also have a few minutes here to answer some questions as well. So thank you very much. Great, thanks. Ian and Michael for an interesting and informative research update and thanks to Rob for joining and assisting with some of the inquiries. I'm not sure how many he got to in the chat box but we do have a number of questions that have come in so I'll go in there and select a few now. Um, question from Dave Ross, has there ever been any biocontrol used for other invasive insects like gypsy moth? Or would this be more connected to bacteria or virus use for control of gypsy moths? Um, so I'm not sure um, exactly about the situation with uh, gypsy moth. Um, so it's possible that uh, Rob Boucher could give more specific information about gypsy moth. But certainly there are um, lots of insect biological control agents that are used for the control of other insects, uh, mostly parasito parasitoids, um, but also some, some viruses and bacteria as well. Um, and indeed, some plant pathogens get used um, for the control of uh, invasive plants as well. Just to add, about, this is Rob, just to add on to that, there, there was an active biocontrol program for gypsy moth in the 80s. Uh, where there was release of a variety of parasitoids. Uh, the biocontrol agent that's probably been the most successful against gypsy moth is a fungus entomophaga uh, that was released around 1905, I think it was, and it didn't actually show up as being in outbreaks until uh, the late 90s when weather, weather conditions permitted that. But that's probably the most successful biocontrol agent against gypsy moth. Thanks, Rob. I've got another question here from Allison Zach, and she asks, has the garlic mustard biocontrol been approved for release in the U.S.? Uh, no. So as sort of noted in the timeline here, it's uh, we're, we've got the go ahead in Canada. Uh, American sort of processes are still uh, still in the works. As, as we've seen, uh, it tends to be a sort of slower and longer permitting process on most of these, that tends to be a, a fairly consistent pattern on that. Um, Rob, do you want to sort of confirm on that? Uh, no, that's fine. Go ahead. You're right that their process is longer and uh, they're still working at it. And I've got another uh, inquiry from Allison as well, and she asks about Phragmites and whether that has been approved in the U.S., but I imagine something similar. It's at a similar stage, yes. Okay. And I've got a question from Dave Beaton. Are we close to biocontrol for buckthorn? Uh, biocontrol for buckthorn has been investigated and it is certainly of interest. Uh, 
um, the issue is finding suitable biocontrol agents. It doesn't, there isn't always an agent that we can find that is specific enough and safe enough to be released. The agent that was under consideration for buckthorn is a psyllid actually similar to the psyllid that uh, Ian talked about, uh, but there is concerns uh, about it uh, its specificity, and so at, at the current time, it's not not being investigated, or the, the research has stopped. Thanks, Rob. Got a question from Diana Shermit, who asks, "What is the efficacy of hypena controlling dog strangling vine? Does it control and reduce seed production? Some research su some research suggests it may increase seed production." Uh, okay, so the still at a very early stage in terms of looking at the uh, impact on the seed production. Um, the one study that was done uh, very early on showed that there could be an increase in seed production in shaded habitats, but that was only uh, in a very specific case. Uh, all of the work that's been done in the laboratory and subsequent to that has indicated that there can be a reduction in seed. However, we're still at a very low density of insects in a very few number of sites to know uh, over time what will be the uh, level of impact that the insects will have. Okay, and I've got a question from Stephanie. For Hypena, is there focus on selection in the lab for non-diapausing insects? So um, it was initially thought that the, the diapause in Hypena uh, is a kind of a non-obligate thing. So they, they don't necessarily need to go into diapause um, after every uh, couple of generations. But what we found is that um, we tend to see a drop in the fitness of populations in the lab that we're mass rearing if we don't put them through a diapause every few generations. Um, some of the rearing of hypena has been more complicated than in um, the knotweed psyllid, for example. And so there hasn't really been much work to, to try and find um, insects that, that diapause uh, less, or certainly diapause, don't go into diapause uh, in response to those shorter day lengths. Thanks, Ian. I've got this question a couple times, but this one here asked by Ron, are you currently looking for additional release sites for any of these species? And if so, which ones? We're still at a pretty early stage in terms of addressing the research questions that need to be addressed in order to get establishment. We have establishment for the, the hypena, um, and when the insects have spread more, or first established and then spread, that's when they would become available, um, hopefully for wider distribution. And it's difficult to say at this point when that will be for each specific insect. Okay, and then I've got a few more here. I'm just gonna select a couple just in the interest of time. Um, does there need to be a minimum size of weed infestation in order for these projects to be able to successfully reproduce season after season? So um, most of these, um, these insects can maintain themselves on relatively small patches um, of the weed, um, but it is an issue sometimes with, uh, that we need to consider with things like integrated weed management whereby if we combine things like cutting treatments uh, or herbicide treatments, we need to leave behind um, a kind of refugia, uh, some degree of healthy weed to allow these uh, insects to perpetuate themselves through those processes. Um, but most of the release sites, obviously, that we're choosing, there's, there's no shortage of the, of the weed in question. Uh, at this point, we're often choosing things that are, are manageable for monitoring as well. Uh, but one of the advantages of this kind of control measure can be uh, actually going after some of these smaller patches that are maybe not as uh, practical or as efficient to go after with larger things like a, a burning or a spray, for example. <laughs> 
Great, thank you both. And one last question. Is there any investigations into a biocontrol program for Norway maple? No. Uh, well, I'd just like to address, there's a couple of questions about the risks associated with these doing biocontrol, which Michael has, has mentioned, the host range testing that takes place. That's one of the key focuses of any biocontrol program is making sure that the insects are specific and safe and will only attack the target weed. Uh, a lot of the research questions that both Michael and Ian have talked about in this presentation are the next step of sort of what sort of impact can it have and at what scale, uh, how quickly will the insect spread uh, and at what scale that impact will occur. But in terms of host specificity, um, the agents, uh, the risks are minimized and if, and it's also in terms of considering as uh, Michael mentioned, the risks of doing nothing for native species. So it's trying to balance those risks, uh, but in terms of specificity and safety, uh, that's that's a key focus of the pre-release program. Great, thanks, Rob. Um, I think that's all the questions we have for you guys today. Um, I would like to say thank you again to Ian, Michael, and Rob for your time, and thank you to our audience for tuning in. This webinar will be recorded and it will be posted on our website at www.invasivespeciescenter.ca. Um, just on this slide here, if you do have any further questions, um, you can direct them to Ian and Michael at their contact info below. Um, hopefully I've given enough time for you guys to take that down if you do require it. Just keep it up for a couple more seconds before I switch to the next slide. And at invasivespeciescenter.ca, you can find a number of things, including best management practices, species profiles, video resources, newsletters and blog content, and more. And that's where you'll find the recorded version of this webinar, as I've said. Our next webinar will be on Tuesday, December 8th, and it is titled Present Status and Update on the Management of Emerald Ash Borer in Canada. And Dr. Chris McQuarrie from the Canadian Forest Service will be joining us as our speaker. Um, so you can find more info and a registration link at our, uh, at our webinar series page on our, on our website. Um, and I'd like to send out a final thank you to our speakers. We hope you enjoyed today's presentation and we hope to see you in the next one. Um, but until then, we wish you all a wonder, wonderful afternoon. So take care. <laughs>